Okay, so let's talk about some of the most common types of disorders that you may, guys may experience and or come across. Um, so let's first take an evolutionary overview. The whole idea with evolution is that we possess characteristics and traits that have been adapted in the past. If they weren't adapted, they would have been selected against. So the reason that we have things like memory and language is because it's provided some benefit to our ancestors. So the idea is that adaptations are fitted for a particular environment. And in that environment, those adaptations do really, really well. So here, here's this cute little kid. You can't see very well. He looks Scandinavian. He doesn't have a whole lot of pigment in his skin. This is a really good adaptation if you live up north where you have less exposure to the sun because your skin needs to absorb the uh, sunlight and do the whole biology thing to make, what, vitamin E, I think? Is that right? I don't know. So anyway, this is really, really adaptive in that particular environment. But if you take this kid and you throw him down on the equator, what's going to happen to him? His skin will actually get darker, he'll tan, but what else is going to happen, like, very, like, this first day or this first week? He's He'll be hot, yeah. What happens if you go out in the sun for too long? Sunburn. You get sunburned, right? So he's going to get really, really bad sunburns when he goes down to the equator. So his skin is adapted for his environment, but not so adapted for everywhere else. Oh, vitamin D, not vitamin D. Uh -huh. Out of the environment, they might harm. So you get less pigment in regions with more sun. If you put them in areas where there's more sun, they get more cancer. So there's variability in traits and behavior. So people that live closer to the equator typically have darker skin than people that live farther away. Anxiety disorder. So notice that this is anxiety disorder, not anxiety. Anxiety itself is adaptive. How can anxiety be adaptive? You're anxious about my test. What do you do? Study. You study, right? Your anxiety leads you to do something to combat the anxiety, right? So the anxiety itself can be very adaptive. It can help us plan for the future. It can help us avoid mistakes. It can help us be safe. So I am a little afraid of heights. And, you know, I'm very confident about standing up. Like, I'm really good at standing up. No big deal. But if you, like, put a ledge with a big drop, like, I'll do one of those things if I want to see over it. And I'll stay, like, a little bit back. Because even though I'm really confident standing up, for some reason, if you put this ledge right next to me, ooh, I'm anxious. This is good. It keeps me safe. I'm less likely to fall over the edge if I'm staying over here while I'm walking, unlike my daughter who's like, ee. So anxiety can be adaptive. However, too much of it can be bad. Too much can be disorderly, right? Too much anxiety can be deviant. All of us experience anxiety at some point in time. So just experience anxiety isn't deviant by itself. But how much anxiety do you experience? How strongly do you fail anxiety? Do you, does this anxiety cause you distress? I would argue yes, like depression, anxiety is something that feels sort of negative automatically. And if you have too much anxiety about something, this can also lead to disability. So I haven't seen my mom in almost two years. This year, tomorrow. Why haven't I seen my mom? Well, I'm cheap and I can't afford to go to the States by myself, and I can't afford to, to send my mom over here. But my mom could afford to come over here, so why hasn't she come? Can you need this? She's afraid of flying. Yeah, my mom is afraid of flying. So this has disabled her from coming and seeing her family. If she would have had a job that required a lot of flying, she wouldn't be able to take it. So too much of something that's adaptive in some situations can be maladaptive in others. There's about a 28.8% lifetime prevalence of anxiety disorders. So the first one I want to talk about is generalized anxiety disorder, and hopefully this will help you understand the difference between this and uh, panic disorder. So with generalized anxiety disorder, 
there is excessive worry and anxiety that's much more than normal. You see someone that's cute and you want to ask them out on a date, you're going to feel anxious. Someone with generalized anxiety disorder would feel much more anxious than you normally would in, under that situation. It's more than what's adaptive and it's uncontrollable. They have a hard time overcoming their anxiety and it's generalized. It's related to lots and lots of different areas of life. So they're worried about their work. Am I going to keep my job? They're worried about their school. Am I going to get good grades? Are the teachers going to like me? They're worried about their romance. Oh, does he or she like me? Oh, they're worried about the family. But all of this is much, much more than what all of us probably experience at some point during our day-to-day -day lives. And this is most of the time. How often do you worry about school? Do you worry about school every day? No. Probably not. You worry about school, like, I remember when I worried about school. It's like the day before the exam. Or for some classes, it might have been the week before the exam. But usually it was just small periods of time. And then the exam was over, and you go outside and you go, woohoo, and the anxiety is gone. All right, panic disorder. How is this different? Well, with panic disorder, it's not this generalized anxiety about everything, but there's this pan these unexpected panic attacks that occur. So this is different than panicking before a big date or a big project, right? So if you have a big exam and you know you haven't studied well and you know you're failing the class and you know you have to pass the test and do really well to get an A or to pass, you're going to panic a little bit, right? This is sort of normal. You could expect people to panic before a big exam or before a big job interview or for my mom maybe to fly on something. Actually, that's a little bit unreasonable. But with the panic disorder, people have panic attacks unexpectedly. So remember when we talked about the autonomic nervous system? There was the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for fighting and fleeing, like kicks into overdrive, so you get adrenaline coursing through your system, you get cortisol coursing through your system, which is good for small things, but not good regularly. So you get the sweating, the nausea, the pounding heart, people can't breathe, they have tremors. Now, because these panic attacks can happen at unexpected times and in unexpected places, this can make people worried about having more. If I knew when I was going to have a panic attack, why might that be better than if it was unexpected? You'd be ready for it. Yes. You'd be ready for it, right? So if I knew every day I have a panic attack at 7 o'clock, I would go home at 7 o'clock and I would have my panic attack, right? But if it's, yes? Could you try saying that again? So, if you know that you have panic attacks unexpectedly, then... No, unexpectedly, she says, like, at, at, every day at 7 o'clock you have this panic attack. Mm -hmm. And today, actually, you will not say, but you know that you will have, and you expect that you will have today. So, it's okay, and it, the, the idea become reality in this case. Mm -hmm. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy, like you're expecting to have the panic attack and then you have a panic attack. Yeah, absolutely, that could completely happen. But I guess what I'm trying to say is if you knew when you were going to have a panic attack, it wouldn't be a big deal. Who here has had diarrhea? Had? Yeah, in the past. Has had, who has had diarrhea? Four people have had <laughs> diarrhea. <laughs> you guys know what diarrhea is? I don't know. Okay, so diarrhea is when you have to go to the bathroom, and you have to go to the bathroom like right now, and it's, it's kind of gross and liquidy. So, yeah, okay. So diarrhea is really, really bad if you have it, because you don't know when you're going to have to go. And it hits you and you're like, oh, I got to find a toilet, where is one, right? Now, with, a, with like normal, normal bowel movements, you can plan ahead. Oh, okay, I'll go to the bathroom now. But the problem with having diarrhea, what do people not want to do if they're doing it? 
If you have a date, do you want to go out on your date? If you have a job interview, do you want to go to your job interview while you're having diarrhea? No! Right? This causes more anxiety. So the people with panic attacks, they fear having more. And because of this, they're worried about having a panic attack in front of other people. Right? So if I had a panic attack right now, I might be worried that you guys might think of me less. Right? Because there are stigmas associated with mental disorders. So what might I want to do if I didn't want to have a panic attack in front of you? Well, if I just stay home, then I don't have to. People with agoraphobia are anxious about being in places or situations from which escape might be difficult or embarrassing. A lot of them will stay at home. They don't want to go to the mall because it's hard to get out of the mall. I mean, it's not really that hard, but like if you have a panic attack, it's not like you can wait. Oh, you know, I have to go to the washroom now. I'll wait 20 minutes. No, you're having your panic attack right then, right? Were any of you guys here last year when the student had an epileptic attack out in front of Cafe Crown? Like, that student, I would guess that he didn't want everyone to know that he had epilepsy, but he couldn't control it. He couldn't say, oh, I'll have my attack in 20 minutes. Let me go someplace else and have it in private, right? So these types of things can lead to agoraphobia. So people are, away, are afraid of going in public places like stores, parks, highways, they're afraid of going to public events like meetings and dances, and this leads them to avoid such places or situations. So they often will just stay at home. Okay, what are specific phobias? Now like generalized anxiety, this is like, you're anxious about almost everything. But the panic disorder, it's not that you're anxious about necessarily everything, but that for whatever reason, at whatever time, boom, you experience a panic disorder. Or a uh, panic attack. How about with specific phobias? You're, you're afraid of specific things. You're afraid of particular things. Some people are really afraid of spiders. Some people are really afraid of clowns. Some people are really afraid of dogs. Some people are really afraid of blood, of snakes, darkness, being in a small, enclosed space. Now, these are unreasonable fears of some stimulus or event. Again, think about uh, some of these disorders as being adaptive in the undisordered state. Is it adaptive to be a, afraid of spiders? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because they feel bad? I would argue that they feel bad is not necessarily a good reason to be afraid of spiders. Yeah, they can kill you. A spider can kill you. Oh yeah, I know, I mean, there's the, but usually the ones we see, they're not like... Yeah, a lot of the ones that we see are not. Uh, my grandma, or my great-grandma lived in Texas, and we were very worried about the spiders, because there were black widow spiders, and there was some other type of really nasty spider. If they bit you, you die. Anyway, this is more than the normal fear of heights, snakes, and other things. And the person is aware that this is unreasonable. So the exposure to the stimulus produces anxiety and potentially a panic attack. This leads to avoidance of the distressing experience of such stimuli or events, and this can interfere with normal functioning. So if you go to YouTube and do a search for phobias and pickles, you will see this video of a female who has a phobia to pickles. I'm not sure if this is actually real or if it's fake. But she can't stand pickles. They like really freak her out. And she works in a restaurant. And they serve pickles. So if her customer asks for pickles with her sandwich, she says, I'm sorry, you have to go get them yourself. Or you're going to have to talk to somebody else. Could this make it difficult for her to make a good living? Yeah, absolutely. She could get fired. She might get smaller tips. So these phobias can often lead to Distressing experiences and things that can lead to disability. How about post-traumatic stress disorder? So post-traumatic means after. after some type of trauma. So something traumatic happened. You saw someone get killed. You were worried about yourself getting get killed. Something like this. Someone is exposed to a life-threatening event that was traumatically experienced. Now, notice you have to traumatically experience it. 
if you see someone get killed and you think like, oh, that's interesting, you're not going to have post-traumatic stress disorder because you didn't experience it as traumatic, right? But if you see the same thing and you think, oh my goodness, it's horrible. Do you experience it as traumatic you can have post-traumatic stress disorder? Anyway, someone with PTSD experiences and re-experiences the events in trauma. Sometimes they have flashbacks. So occasionally you'll hear about people who served in wars. And they'll be at home and someone will light off a firecracker outside. And this will induce a flashback where they sort of relive the part of the war. They might even try to duck in covering and get away. So people try to avoid cues to the traumatic events. And this causes significant distress or disability. You're not just reliving a bad event, but reliving it in a way that affects your ability to work, be productive, and happy. All right, how about obsessive compulsive disorder? There have been a lot of movies about this. People with obsessive compulsive disorder, they they obsess about things. What are obsessions? Too much. Could be anything. Could be anything like what? Like for instance, people uh, have fear about uh, cleanliness, uh -huh. and they just uh, clean their hands for many times. Like they they fear uh, about being sick. Yeah. Because of not uh, lack of cleanliness. So and uh, they clean everywhere. So there are two components to this that she said. She said, one, people are like really concerned about being clean, right? This is where the obsession comes in. And the obsession is basically thoughts that preoccupy your attention. You're constantly thinking about it. Is this clean? Is this clean? Is this clean? And by constantly thinking about is this clean, maybe there's some germs on it, then they feel compelled. They have compulsions where they feel like they have to do something. Let's wash my hands again. Let's wash the dishes again. And these compulsions are aimed at reducing the stress from the obsessions. Again, this can be something that's adaptive. Right? Is it a good thing to be concerned about cleanliness? Yeah, if you're not concerned at all about cleanliness, you're going to go outside and play with the kitty, and then you drop something on the ground, you pick it up, you throw it out, and then you're going to eat your lava June. And you put your hands in your mouth, and no big deal, right? You get sick. You could die. But if you have some concern, if you think a little bit about cleanliness and you realize it's important, then you go wash your hands before you eat that lamajin. Or maybe you'll take colonia, right? The colonia, this is something that they, we don't do in the States, but you guys do a lot here. Pour the colonia on your hands, there's alcohol in it, it kills germs, right? So have your little colonia, now you're clean, now you can eat, you're less likely to die. So this is something that can actually be adaptive, but in people with this disorder, they take it to an unadaptive state where they're constantly thinking about cleanliness. It doesn't have to be about cleanliness, it could be other things too. So some people, uh, they might feel obsessed to check and recheck whether the door is locked at night. Is this a good thing? Yeah. Taken to a reasonable extent, right? You make sure you're safe. But if you keep doing it over and over again, this is disrupting your sleep. Okay, so matiform disorders. When we talked about the, uh, the neurons, we said they have dendrites, they have an axon, they have a soma. And the soma was the body. So the somatoform disorders, if you remember that soma means body, these are basically body form disorders. These are mental disorders with physical symptoms. So, lots of mental disorders have physical symptoms. When people feel a panic attack, they experience physical symptoms. They sweat. Their heart rate increases, right? Uh, when people are stressed, this can increase the production of cytokines, which can induce the sickness response. Um, so we have other mental disorders that have physical symptoms as well, but the other disorders, they're not just limited primarily to the, the physical symptoms. Somatoform disorders often co-occur with anxiety and mood disorders. Okay, so let's talk about mood disorders. What are the mood disorders? They're disorders of moods. moods. What are moods? 
state of the mind. Okay, anything else? What mood are you in right now? Sleepy and active, comfortable or bored? Comfortable. Ah, good answer. <laughs> Some of you could be happy, some of you could be sad, some of you could be bored. These are moods, right? They're the way people feel at a particular point in time. With the mood disorders, you have a persistent or episodic exaggeration of a mood state. Feeling better than is normal or feeling worse than is normal. And the feelings are not culturally expected in uh, the experience of some event. Remember when we talked about hedonic adaptation and you win the lottery, you have like a million euros? Are you feeling better than normal? Oh, yeah. You better believe you're feeling better than normal. You're feeling, you know, super duper awesome. Is this expected? Yes. Yeah, it's totally expected. So we wouldn't say that someone who's feeling much happier after normal, after winning a million euros, is experiencing mood disorder. Uh, also, if you lost a parent or a child or a best friend, they died. Do you feel worse than normal? Probably, right? Probably feel a lot worse than normal. Is this culturally expected? Yeah, absolutely. There's about a 20% lifetime prevalence of the mood disorder. So let's differentiate between the downers. Imagine that we have a scale of, let's say, happiness, positive feelings. And on one hand, you have like people who are feeling extreme joy. And on the other hand, you have people who are feeling extreme sorrow. Extreme, uh, well, I don't want to say depression because it's what I'm going to call it. Whatever, extreme, extreme depression. So we have two types of disorders that are associated with this end of the scale where people are feeling really bad. So what's the difference between major depressive disorder and dysthymic disorder? This was on the quiz. So people with major depressive disorder have experienced what? A major depressive episode, which is what? How do people feel if they're having a major depressive episode? Bad, how bad? Like, so here's normal. Do they feel like, eh, hey, you know, kind of bad, or are they like, whoa, this really sucks? Yeah, it's really extreme, right? Extremely bad feelings. And so a major depressive episode, and it's not just bad feelings, but it's experienced for an extended period of time, at least two weeks. So this isn't like, oh, my girlfriend dumped me, oh, I feel bad, I got over it a few days later. This is something that's hanging over around. Even if you and we're dumped by a girlfriend or boyfriend and we're depressed for two weeks. That might, we might not call that major depressive disorder because of what? If my wife, when I got home today, said, you know, hon, I'm not calling you hon anymore. I'm divorcing you. And assume I feel bad about this. <laughs> If I was happy like two weeks later, would that be normal? Culturally, right? I would be expected to feel very bad for more than two weeks. So in that situation, we wouldn't want to call this major depressive uh, disorder. Anyway, people, they feel a depressed mood, they're sad, and hedonia. So remember when we talked about hedonism, and it's basically the desire to seek out things that create pleasure? So with the end hedonia, they're not looking for the things that create pleasure. They often lose or gain weight, they have problems sleeping, but they're tired, negative feelings, sometimes thoughts of death, and even suicide. But there's no manic, hypomanic, or mixed episodes. None of that. If we had manic, hypomanic, or mixed episodes, this would be bipolar disorder, right? This dynamic disorder, on the other hand, what's this like? It's longer lasting. So it's much longer than a major depressive episode. What else? Is it as extreme? In the sense of like the, the intenseness of the feelings? 
Actually, with dysthymic disorder, it's similar to depressive disorder, but there's no major depressive episode. The symptoms, they last longer, but they're not as severe. So lots of times, people with dysthymic disorder, they might not even be diagnosed because it's not as severe, it may not be as noticeable to other people, and it's lasting such a long time, it could seem normal. Again, there's no manic, hypomanic, or mixed episodes. With seasonal affective disorder, there's a uh, major depressive disorder, but it usually reoccurs at particular times of the year, typically during the shorter winter months. Okay, the ups and downs. People with bipolar disorder, not only have they experienced a major depressive episode, they have also experienced a manic episode where they are feeling elated, but this is not elation in reference to some culturally ex expected. Uh, this is not a culturally expected elation. It's they just feel great. They can't particularly explain why. So they have one or more major depressive episodes, and they have a manic episode where they have increased energy. They talk really, really fast, like I do. Uh, increased hedonism, where they're constantly searching for pleasure, they're easily distractible. Mixed episodes, on the other hand, are when you are mixing a manic episode also with a depressive episode at the same time, or a hypomanic episode, where maybe they don't get as extreme, but they still feel much better than the average person does most of the time. With cyclothymic disorder, think of dysthymic disorder, that is, you're not completely down in the dumps, but you've been down a lot, but you also have some hypomanic episodes. Now, these switches can take weeks or months. There's a personality disorder that's similar to bipolar, but the switches can occur within a day, even across hours. That's borderline personality disorder. The psychotic disorders, psychosis is a loss of a contact with reality. This can be beneficial because it can help you be empathetic with someone else. I, I can imagine what she's feeling. I can imagine what someone else is feeling. This is a break from reality. I'm not actually feeling it. I'm imagining what someone else is feeling. There's a much smaller prevalence of this. Symptoms of psychosis, you've got positive symptoms like delusions, hallucinations, and also negative symptoms like less affect, less emotion. So maybe your parent dies, but you don't express any type of grief. Oh, man, this is really hard. Last semester, we had an extra day in the semester for some reason, so I broke this up over two lectures, and I'm trying to cram it all in now, so forgive me. All right, the presence of the positive and negative symptoms are often used to diagnose schizophrenia. The dissociative disorders, these are disruptions of memory, consciousness, and identity. Like psychosis, it's a break from reality. But it's not a break from the external reality about what's real out there. Instead, it's a break of internal reality. Who am I? Where have I been? All right, personality disorders. These are enduring patterns of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture. Notice again this cultural component. It affects two or more things, cognition, the affect, these are expressions of emotion, social functioning, or impulse control. And the pattern is inflexible and per pervasive. Personality, when we talked about this earlier, we said that personality is something that people think is fairly stable throughout someone's life, right? So with the personality disorders, often you see that this is something long going. It's not like a major depressive episode where you have it for two weeks to several months. This is going to be something that's going to be for years and years and years, potentially. Patterns awfully often set early in adulthood. So the paranoid personality disorders, people are paranoid. They don't trust other people. Uh, they think others will deceive them. They question their friends' loyalties. Uh, antisocial personality disorder, notice antisocial. If you're antisocial, what do you not want to do? You don't want to socialize, right. Um, but with the antisocial, you can also think of it in the sense of an anti-society, right? So their actions show disregard for others, so they lie to other people, they steal from other people, they're irresponsible, and when they do bad things, they don't show any remorse. Oftentimes, well, I don't know about oftentimes, but sometimes serial killers are diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. 
Remember when we talked about sanity before as the legal definition? Not understanding the difference between right and wrong? By not showing any remorse, they suggest that they don't have an understanding of what's right or wrong. Borderline personality disorder. This is the one sort of like bipolar disorder. They have instability, right? With bipolar disorder, you can feel great and feel horrible. They have unstable relationships. So at times, the relationship is perfect and it's horrible. Unstable self-image, they think of themselves as being super at one moment in time, and a little bit later, they're an idiot. Unstable emotions and so on. Unlike bipolar, this, these changes can vary from hour to hour. So they get an A on the exam, and they think, I'm awesome. And then they go talk with someone, they say something stupid, and their mood changes dramatically. And rather than being super happy about how well they did, now they feel really horrible and like an idiot. Histrionic personality disorder, these people have excessive emotions, dramatic, exaggerated emotions that change rapidly, and they also exaggerate the strength of rela uh, relationships. They try to get attention. These people like a lot of attention. And how do you get attention? Well, if you fail an exam, you can say, shoot, I failed, I'm going to work harder. You can go, <laughs> right, and have all your friends come around and show you attention. Narcissistic personality disorder, these people are self-absorbed, like narcissists in Greek mythology. They have delusions of grandeur, and they think they're special, they're the best, other things like this. They exploit others in life. And finally, we have obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. This is similar to obsessive-compulsive disorder, but it's a personality disorder. So you see this is much more uh, prevalent over a person's life, and it's typically uh, focused on order, control, and perfection. So people are preoccupied with details. People with obsessive compulsive personality disorder make fantastic employees. If you ever run a business and you can find someone with this disorder, hire them. <laughs> they'll do a good job for you. But unfortunately, because they're so preoccupied with their work and their details, they often have very bad family lives. Uh, dependent personality disorder, they depend a lot on others. If they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend that dumps them, they immediately have to find someone else. They don't have their own opinions. Oftentimes, they'll take the opinions of other people. So, I used to not like steak, but then I met my wife. Now I love steak. I took her opinion. No, no, no. Okay. Warning, this is intracyte. We did this in like one lecture, as opposed to a whole semester. So don't think that you guys are qualified to go out and diagnose people. <laughs> um, you can take abnormal psychology with, uh, I think, Elif Chelebri, and she can teach you in a whole semester about these things in much, much greater detail. Um, that said, you are qualified to suggest professional help. If you see a friend that you think is suffering from a major depressive episode, you're not qualified to say whether they have it or not, but you are qualified to say, hey, it looks like there's something wrong. Why don't you go talk with Merva, the counselor? Or go talk to Leaf or someone else. <gasps> okay, next class you have a Leaf. Class after that, you have a test. You want to look at the keys for the previous quizzes? I will spread them out over here.